Write the docs. We're almost there. You just have to sit through one more thing. Um, I want you to know that I think the bar is open, so feel free to hit it up. You don't have to wait until I'm done. OK, so I am Jody Petrino. This is Defying the Status Quo, How a Grassroots Effort Can Transform an Organization. I work at F5 Networks. All views are my own, but yes, I am talking about F5. <laughs> so for starters, warning! This presentation contains Game of Thrones spoilers. <laughs> but I promise they're not from the current season, so it's totally fine. <laughs> so to start with, I just want to say that, you know, if we're going to talk about the status quo, to understand the status quo, we must define the status quo. So our friends at the OED have done that for us. It's simply put, the existing state of affairs. So in the year 2016, Sansa Stark fed Ramsey Bolton to his dogs. He totally deserved it. Jon Snow won the Battle of the Bastards and became the king in the north. Cersei torched the Great Sept. And a scrappy band of agile teams at F5 Networks in Boulder, Colorado, working on open source products. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2016, the status quo for documentation at F5 looks something like this. Um, writers use DITA to write the docs. SME reviews take place via annotated PDFs. All development follows the waterfall model. We publish documentation using an ancient and cranky CMS that doesn't even support linking between documents. <laughs> hellish nightmare. And all content, aside from this, all content is created and hosted on internal resources. So we covered the status quo. Now, before we can defy the status quo, we have to understand the nature of defiance. And again, simply put, it means that we are going to openly resist or refuse to obey. I think this is a good place to insert this slide. I used this slide in my first presentation at Write the Docs two years ago. And at the time, it, it really spoke to me. Because um, at this point in time, F5 as an organization was very much entrenched in the process of being the proxy for the outcome. And that's what Jeff is talking about here. Don't let the process be the proxy for the outcome that you want to achieve via that process. So there was an intense level of importance placed on doing things a certain way because that's just how we'd always done them. Now, don't take this to mean that my teams wanted to throw out everything that existed just for funsies, like we weren't being that dickish. Um, <laughs> there, I'm sorry, I talk with my hands and I swear, so just be warned. Um, <laughs> There was a very real need to figure out a new way to do things for these projects since the status quo as, as it existed, it just didn't support our use case. Open source had never been done at F5 before, so we had to figure out a new way. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you can't use DITA when making open source docs. Totally doable. But you try being a recently hired technical writer with no prior software experience and tell a bunch of developers that not only do they have to write the docs, but they have to use an XML-based language to do it. Tell me how that goes. <laughs> when I did that, they laughed and they told me, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Stop trying to make fetch happen because it's not going to happen. And that was the simple act of defiance that set a content development revolution in motion at F5. I'm so glad the GIF worked. I didn't know if that was going to work or not. <laughs> so since we knew we either wouldn't or couldn't do things the existing way, we developed a new way. We were working on open source, so of course, let's just use open source tools. We'll write in a simple markup language, we pull requests to do reviews, We'll follow agile development methodologies because we were doing that anyway. And we'll deploy using CI CD. Wait a minute. That sounds an awful lot like treating the documentation like the code. We've heard this before. So for those of you that were here uh, for my talk on treating documentation in 2017, 
or have watched it on YouTube or whatever, um, now is the time to head to the bar or take a little quick brain break. Um, I'm going to do a quick synopsis of it. Feel free to tune out and tune back in in a couple minutes. For everyone else, in 2017, I presented on my experience, oh, I forgot, electric boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> in 2017, I presented on my experience uh, discovering and defining what treating documentation like code meant for us. A huge part of that journey of discovery involved watching and rewatching and rewatching and rewatching two presentations from Write the Docs 2015, which were how GitHub uses GitHub to document GitHub. It's a gem, highly recommend it. And Riona, who presented earlier, she did a talk called um, Documentation Disrupted, how two technical writers changed Google engineering culture, built a team, made powerful friends, and got their mojo back. And this was the one that I was just like, I wish I could reach through the screen and just be like, please tell me what to do. Um, but through a lot of trial and error, and breaking shit and fixing it, and breaking shit and fixing it, and lather and repeat, and not a small amount of navel gazing, I eventually figured out what I wanted to achieve and how I was going to get there. Most importantly, I defined a tool set that kept the docs close to the code in the same repo and enabled the devs to contribute docs in ways that felt comfortable to them. Uh, I developed, I encouraged our partners in support and PM to put their knowledge to good use and to contribute to the documentation. I told a lot of people, hey, that's a great idea. You're welcome to open a pull request. Some of them did. Some of them laughed at me. I, uh, I developed a set of basic doc tests that had to pass in order for pull requests to merge, just like the code. And I figured out how to use the CIDC pipeline, uh, CICD pipeline, to build the docs into HTML and deploy them somewhere for publication. Because we couldn't ship any content developed in GitHub back into F5 servers for security reasons, and because our janky old CQ server couldn't actually support our tools and deployment methodologies, because remember, it can't even support linking, so CICD ain't going to work, I made a website to host the docs. Clouddocs.f5.com, or as we know it familiarly in F5, simply just Cloud Docs. So, mission accomplished, right? <laughs> Let's all go home. We're done. No? OK. Uh, we can't just go home and rest on our laurels. And unfortunately for me, we couldn't just hand off the new publishing pipeline and resources to tech comms either. Um, I should probably mention that I was embedded in a PD team, which was separate from tech comms as an org. So I was kind of like a rogue agent. Just for some reason, they just let me do whatever I wanted. <laughs> Um, so we weren't allowed to hand off the new publishing pipeline and the resources that supported it to tech comms so I could go back to be a tech, regular tech writer, which is really all I wanted at the time. My boss, who is a, a stellar boss, uh, he had put his ass on the line to get approval for this little project. And he told me in no uncertain terms that there was no way in hell he was about to hand it off to someone else for safekeeping. So at that point, I told him, fine. Just don't give me access to it. I don't want to be responsible for the upkeep. I just want to write the docs. And for a time, it worked. He handled the admin BS, and I just wrote the docs. But of course, eventually, things shifted in the org. He went off to head up another project, and I ended up with the keys to the Cloud Docs kingdom. So when we started Cloud Docs, this is my little Cloud Docs guy. Oh, shoot. I just ruined the surprise there. Sorry. That's my Cloud Docs guy. I'm still really proud of him. Uh, when we started Cloud Docs, it was out of necessity. We had a few open source projects that literally had nowhere else to go. And we never intended for it to be anything more than a place for those specific projects to publish their docs. But even before the site was live, I got an email from a coworker who was interested in publishing some lab guides to the site. He was dealing with the same issues we were. He wanted to develop the content in GitHub, and he had nowhere to publish. So we added his project to Cloud Docs. And then we added other projects. And they told other teams, and they told other teams, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the theme that tied all of these projects and teams together was that the status quo just wasn't working for them. 
So fast forward 2019, where are we now? There are, uh, Cloud Docs is not just for open source projects at F5 anymore. We have a mix of open source and proprietary products publishing docs to Cloud Docs because they decided that they needed or wanted to develop docs like code. The Tech Pubs team, I'm happy to announce, just launched a new website on a new hosting platform and enabled their first automated publishing pipeline. So CQ is dead. Long live CQ. <laughs> uh, and most importantly, they're able to put the control over publishing into the hands of the content creators and not gate it by people whose full-time job was managing releases because the old platform was so terrible. Uh, we have a team of Cloud Docs admins and developers, one of whom is two, two of whom, one of whom is also in this room, I believe. David's here somewhere. Thanks, David. Uh, <laughs> Cloud Docs has a team of volunteer admins who can set up CI CD workflows, answer questions, and train other documentarians on the tool set. And we have actual developers who help with front end web development and test and deployment pipelines. Uh, we are working together across silos to define shared content creation tools and processes with a renewed focus on the information consumer instead of how things are being created. And there's a general recognition at F5 that it's not how you create the content that matters, but it's rather the experience that the content provides to the customer that we want to focus on. So you may ask yourself, <laughs> how did I get here? <laughs> so. Cliff's notes, uh, we got here through a, a very, very strong commitment to helping others, to um, being my project's fiercest and, and most loyal advocate, um, providing consistent messaging, avoiding emotional reactions, and a shit ton of patience. I, I just realized I should have had like an Axl Rose image there. <laughs> oh well. Next time, lessons learned. <laughs> so first of all, um, this is the absolute most important element that contributed to the success of the Cloud Docs project. Being the only person responsible for Cloud Docs meant that I was also the only person available to help. This means that when somebody wanted to onboard a new project and things went wrong at 10 o'clock at night and the content needed to be published in time for a major corporate event that was happening the following morning, I was the one that needed to sort it out. This also meant that when people were adopting our, adapting our tools, oh, I can't speak, when they were adopting our tool set <laughs> and they needed training on how to use the tools, I was the one who provided that training. When they had questions, I answered them. When new projects wanted to come on board, I gathered the requirements, I planned the implementations out, some of which were like a quarter ahead of time, and I did the work. And it might sound overwhelming and quite honestly, it, it was at times, but ultimately I did it because I loved being able to help people solve their documentation problems. They went away happy and they shared their happy stories with others. So happy people share happy stories. Frustrated people share frustrated stories. So you may ask yourself, what do you want the story to be? That's how the word got out about Cloud Docs. Happy people, like my, my coworker uh, Hitesh with the lab guides, he has a certain degree of clout in the company. He went away very, very happy, and he was able to establish an entire team of people following the docs-like code process and publishing their content to Cloud Docs because he liked it so much. So my efforts to help others succeed ultimately helped the project to succeed. Next thing to remember, um, you are the expert, right? This is your project, you know it better than anyone. You are its best and probably only advocate. <laughs> now, this doesn't just mean that you're the person who represents the project to others across the company. It also means that you are responsible for not letting other people misrepresent your project. Looks tasty, right? <laughs> so as my project's best advocate, I present it as the burger that you want to eat. And you know, if you're, if you're a veggie, this is a veggie burger. If you're a meaty, this is a meaty burger. If you're neither, I'm sorry. If you don't, just don't like burger, tough. I didn't have a better analogy. <laughs> so unfortunately, it, yeah, I crack myself up. Don't worry about me. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, at times, other 
Can you still hear me? Hands, if you can hear me? Okay, cool. We're good. Thanks for being on standby, though. Good looking out. Uh, so unfortunately, at times, others might represent it as the burger that you definitely don't want to eat. Um, and an example of this is about a year ago, some discussions were underway for about how to finally replace the antiquated system and migrate all the content off of it. And it was getting rather urgent. I don't know why it was urgent like three years into that conversation instead of at the beginning, but I digress. Uh, the team responsible for that explored a lot of options, including looking at Cloud Docs. And they finally concluded that um, because Cloud Docs wasn't, de wasn't deemed to be enterprise ready, and in fairness, it wasn't, uh, a DITA CMS seemed to be the best candidate for that. So when the person in charge of the effort reported her conclusions to the various VPs who were responsible for making that decision, she included a representation of Cloud Docs that was very much the inappetizing burger that you see, which was problematic for me since I had so carefully built it up to be the delicious burger that you actually want to eat, which brings me uh, Technology fail. Hang on. <laughs> so um, this misrepresentation of my project to the decision makers in the company was a very real threat to its continued existence. And the temptation to react emotionally was very, very strong. You might be tempted to say Dracaris and just burn the whole thing down, um, but you don't. You might write the angry email, but you don't send it. You write and rewrite and rewrite the angry email, but you still don't send it. And then eventually, instead of anger, you might end up with a thoughtful and productive response. And when you step back and think about what the best approach to the situation is, you formulate a plan and you carry it out. Because, oops, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so what did I do? I brought my concerns to my boss and to his boss. I gave them the slides that I had created that clarified what Cloud Docs was all about, and I asked them to share the information up the chain of command. And lo and behold, Cloud Docs and our Docs-like code tool set lived to fight another day, because at the end of the day, it is just business. It's not personal. My coworker didn't have a vendetta against me or Cloud Docs. She was just doing her job. So the takeaway here is that when things happen that you can't control, and they will, uh, and things that you don't like, and they will, you will have an emotional reaction. But instead of approaching these situations emotionally, you need to take a step back, give yourself a chance to breathe, and approach the situation thoughtfully and rationally. Be a strategist. Emotional detachment is hard. Emotional involvement is natural and easy. Don't be easy. <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed at that. <laughs> okay, so the, the next most important thing is be consistent. And um, this coin really has two sides. So when you're consistently sharing the same message with everyone, you don't have to keep track of it. You know it by heart, hence the Mark Twain quote here. Now this gets harder as the project grows because you can't control everything your coworkers say and do. But as long as you're consistent in conversations with them, you can ensure that they're sharing the right information out with others. The Cloud Docs project eventually got to the point where I admitted that I needed help. So I formed a team of admins, and I trained them on everything I'd been doing alone up till then. We created an internal wiki page, and we used that to share information about Cloud Docs with others. So directing people to a central resource, we could control the information that they received and make sure that the messaging stayed consistent. Now, the other side of this coin is basically just avoiding the temptation or excitement of promising things that you don't know can be done yet. So don't equate what you want to do with what you can actually do. Um, and there's not a really fun story to back that up other than self-preservation. <laughs> so uh, at one point in time, I was talking to so many people uh, about Cloud Docs, I just had to make sure I had a line and I stuck to it, because otherwise I would be hopelessly lost and I would never remember what I said to which person. And um, I tend to get excited about new things. I call them squirrel moments. Like, oh, look, squirrel. Uh, yeah, squirrel. Um, and I really needed, uh, <laughs> needed to make sure that I wasn't promising things to people that didn't really exist. Because if I did promise those things to people, then I was going to have to be the one to figure out how to del deliver it. And that was just not possible. 
So I kind of lied. It's not really a two-sided coin. It's like a three-sided coin, which I know isn't really a thing, but just bear with me. Um, the final thing to keep in mind in your message of consistency is that you could potentially find yourself in a situation where def you're defending your project's existence. And if you're inconsistent in your messaging and representation of the project, you're, vul you're vulnerable. Um, anything you say can be used against you, so be mindful that you stay on message and don't give them any ammunition. So finally, Tom Petty was right, folks. The waiting, it is the hardest part. <laughs> you have to be patient. Change takes time, especially in large organizations. We started this effort in 2016. Now, in 2019, F5 is undergoing a major digital transformation effort. The Cloud Docs admin team is involved in all of the conversations from digital content creation to single sourcing to taxonomy. We still regularly explain and defend the site's existence, and that's OK. <laughs> so I used this slide in the original Docs Like Code presentation to demonstrate the magnitude of the things that we didn't know. And I use it now because it applies just as well to the fact that in just three years, we've gone from a hacked together general mishmash of wibbly wobbly CI CDE doc stuff to uh, where my doc, Doctor Who, anyone? Where are my Doctor Who folks at? <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, <laughs> to a legitimate web property with visibility up to the C suite. Which brings me to this quote. I'm going to take a minute and let that sink in. The status quo is, in fact, the biggest threat for companies to our cultures, to our personal growth. This quote is from the current CEO of F5 Networks. It's a big change in three years. So a big part of what made the project successful for us was our startup culture. Working as agile teams, making iterative releases, embracing new technologies and open source practices, these were our directive in our location from the get-go. We had to wait for the rest of the company to catch up. The methodologies without the culture don't work. It has to be supported from the top down. And I've told people this repeatedly. And every project that I've either consulted on or been directly part of that implemented docs like code, I would tell them, if this directive doesn't come from the top down, it ain't going to work. So we now have leadership in place that embraces change and empowers individuals to be owners. So when we started, there was no possible way that the way the company had been doing things for years could be used to produce either the product we needed or its documentation. We fought tooth and nail to be able to do things differently. But now, thanks to both a groundswell of support from colleagues across the company and a shift in focus on the part of leadership, the Cloud Docs site, and more importantly, the Docs Like Code methodologies that support it, are a very real part of the discussion to shape what content creation across F5 looks like going into the future. And the takeaway here is that you too can defy the status quo. Would you like to know more? <laughs> yes, I would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Uh, so your journey won't be the same as mine. But I'm sharing here some elements of mine that can help you on yours, whether you're just thinking of starting out or you're currently embroiled in a morass that you can't really see the road out of. So first of all, carefully assess the problem that you're trying to solve and focus on the desired outcomes. How can you best ensure that you can achieve that outcome? Try to design a solution that scales. This is a big one. It's, it's hard, but it's worth it. Because if you really want your project to be successful at a, an organizational level, you need to make sure that you design it in a way that it can be extended to that broad of scale. Be broad-minded. See previous point. Be flexible. This is also hard. You have to be willing to fail. That's part of Agile, right? Like It allows us to fail. That's why we iterate. We go back to the drawing board. We figure out a new way break shit, fix it, break it again, fix it again, every time you learn something. Be flexible enough to allow yourself to fail and to learn new things. Be forward thinking. Try to anticipate what the needs are going to be a year from now, two years from now, three years from now. Who knows? Could be a completely different corporate culture. I mean, it certainly was for me. If you do have a corporate culture that you can use to your advantage, use it. 
So uh, I just helped create a slide deck for the VPs in which I um, tied important information about Cloud Docs to our BF5 cultures. And I fully expect this to be escalated up to the C-suite and have to present to them about it at some point. So what better way to frame it than in the context that they would like us to view all of our work for the company? It just makes sense. Be open and be mindful of others' efforts. Try to involve them, or at least try not to look like you're a threat. Acknowledge, finally, and I don't have a bullet point for this, but this is really important. Acknowledge that it's going to be a tremendous and at times exhausting effort. And don't let that be a barrier to starting. Just make sure you stretch first. <laughs> Finally, uh, I don't know if it's actually true, but it has been for me. Be bold, and mighty forces will come to your aid. Thank you. I have been Jody Petrino, and you have been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>